CBO and, and Dan Torrey from NPC. Um, there's a bit of confusion on the programme, it refers to, to Paul Montgomery, so I'll admit to a spectacular failure to communicate to so, with someone who's in my own department. And, uh, to, to come to the point, I forgot to ask him to, to come here today, which is why there, there is that title on the programme. So um, I apologise for that, he would have had some very interesting things to say. Um, the way we're going to do this is just five minutes from each or so from each of Carl and Dan, deliberately designed to raise uh, some questions uh, for um, discussion. We'll throw the floor open uh, from there um, and try and be hopefully as provocative uh, as possible um, and raise the, the uh, level of debate, I hope. So, over to you. Yeah. Thanks. I don't know about raise it. I think it's pretty uh, good so far. Um, I'm just going to touch on a few things, a bit more about impact measurement. We've been talking about a lot of uh, things this morning so far about all sorts of aspects of, of data. Uh, this will be mainly about uh, impact measurement because that's a, you see if you haven't come across this, we're uh, a consultancy and think tank are dedicated to trying to improve the impact of the sector, both the funders and the charities. And if you like, the sort of the problem, the problem is um, that charities and actually lots of others, I worked in central government for uh, many years, uh, we don't know, really know often whether we're making any difference to anything. Uh, we're not sure what to measure and in the charity world philanthropists and foundations don't quite know what to fund what is it that's working and so the result of that is there's all sorts of stuff we're all doing loads of things 160,000 registered charities hundreds of thousands of community groups and we don't really we're not learning anything really um, about what works and what doesn't work and, and, uh, and learning from each other so we can all do what we all claim to want to do which is to help more people um, and this is of course this is of course difficult stuff uh, the sector wouldn't exist, though, uh, without the passion. That's why people get involved, but we've really got to get them thinking harder about the impact. And certainly we, we found that the key thing in this, and it's always been mentioned by Neil, actually, is, is getting charities clear about what it is they're trying to achieve. And that's the kind of theory of change language that I suspect most of you are familiar with, which we're a bit guilty of, of bringing uh, into this country and pushing hard. But it is that, that's the sort of number one thing before you get into data and the ethics of data and measurement everything else, if you don't know what it is you're trying to achieve, uh, and that is obviously often very, very disputed within charities, it's remarkable how much <coughs> change work we do and how tense it gets within charities, uh, arguments as about what's going on, uh, then you'll never get anywhere. And then when you've got that, you can then start to try and ask this question about impact, you can try and take into part of your organisation so it thinks that matters, and I think that's slowly happened in the sector. Um, and I think it's very important at the minute that charities are trying to do this. I think it's always important just because we should be trying to do the best we can for our cause with the resources we've got, but also because the sector's under a fair amount of attack <coughs> these days uh, for all sorts of things. Uh, public press are a bit sceptical. Um, and I'm not saying that, that, that the fact that we can prove our impact means that that, that will all disappear. The Olive Cook affair would cause problems uh, in the way the charities are going about fundraising, whatever we did but it would certainly help. So then you get into the issue, okay, so what does that mean for the kind of levels of evidence? And, and it's a very simple diagram. If you like, you know, the sort of dream academics on the right, randomised control, trials about everything, and then over here, something that none of us here, I'm sure, would agree with. A few anecdotes don't really prove anything. We, we tend to, we've slightly pushed back against the way people sometimes present this. And you might be aware of the Nesta... Uh, sort of ladder of evidence, which sort of puts this as a ladder, which kind of suggests that what everyone should be trying to do is climb up it to the great randomised control trial in the sky. And I think that's a danger because for a lot of charities, uh, it's much better to do something in the middle and do it really well than to try and push on to something that's not proportionate for you, you haven't got the data, um, just come with crazy numbers. Do, you know, if the best you can do is quality cause work to be very good, do it well. Don't want, if, if, if it's not, you're not up to collecting massive data sets, don't, don't do it. Um, so I think that, that, is a, that is a problem. And, and we've tried to push quite hard, strangely enough, for an organisation that pushes data and, and everything. We've been recently pushing that some charities are collecting data they don't really need to collect, and this is all madness. There's a, a recent blog by one of my colleagues called Five Types of Data for Assessing Your Work. And it's one of the things it argues, for instance, if you're a small charity, for instance, um, doing mentoring or something for young kids. Um, for God's sake, don't follow them over 20 years and find out whether it worked with a control group. Find out whether there's some good academic evidence that that kind of mentoring really works, and then prove that you're doing the mentoring very well. 
uh, and there's a lot of uh, sort of slight nonsense that's come through into the sector. Of course, there's lots of hard issues in impact, and I'm sure people in this room will be well aware of them. There's the attribution issues, that's whether our data is any good, it's expensive, it can be expensive, time scales for evaluation, particularly if you're doing preventative work, which a lot of charities are very hard to prove, uh, and sort of countercultural to the sector. I think this second point, I'm afraid, I'm, you know, there's a lot of the academics in the room, but there's a lot of absolute rubbish coming out of academia and from some consultants. Social return on investment, which got kicked off when I was still in government, and the cabinet office paper I think people still use, is a very, very good framework about thinking about life. But then to translate everything into one pound in, 15 pounds back, when you have no serious control group, is absolute madness. And there's some terrible stuff out there. And we've had, I think, some of John's uh, colleagues have written papers about uh, SROI inflation. Uh, everyone's got to, you know, you're not allowed to say one pound in, two pounds back anymore. Funders say, that's not very good. These other guys say one pound in, 10 pounds back. The fact that the work was rubbish uh, isn't looked at. So that there's all sorts of, uh, of issues here. Charities wonder whether funders really care about this stuff. Um, interesting, some work we did a little while ago asking charities where they were doing more impact work uh, and said, why did you start doing it? And they said, well, because funders all want it, you know, they all want evidence of our impact. Uh, and then we said, well, well, having done it, what did you find? Did the money come pouring in? And they said, no. But they said, what was good is we could now be a better organisation and allocate our own resources better. So, um, and there's an issue about our a lot of organisations now. A, you know, any self-respecting charity that's big enough has got to have a, you know, a measurement team and all the rest of it. But is anyone actually making uh, resource allocation decisions based on it? Are we actually learning anything, or is it just something to shove in our in our brochures and, and, and all the rest of it? And one of the things that that uh, we published about all this is called the, our four pillars uh, approach. Um, the we re I mean, I think all of this stuff is difficult. We published a paper recently, I just want to touch on a few things, of some new things knocking around. They've already been mentioned by, by just about everyone so far, but we uh, glossily called it eight innovations in, uh, in measurement and evaluation, which were kind of globally sourced. I'll just mention a couple of these. I think it's just, it just gives a feel that there are new things going, going on uh, in the measurement world which are useful in the sector. One of them, which is the shared measurement, side. And essentially that's just saying, can we get organisations doing similar things to use similar metrics? And then we learn. Because now we can see uh, you know, why some people on that metric seem to be doing better, and some are worse, and then we can try and understand what's going on. And you can do that collectively if you're a bit nervous, like we had in the HLF example, of kind of exposing those who are doing less well. And a good example here is Safe Lives, which some of you might know, which is a, whole, a lot of the uh, domestic abuse charities that work together. And and using shared metrics, getting the data collected in the same way, they uncovered various things, including that those charities who had tried to have somebody uh, located in the A&E departments picked up things much quicker, and a lot of other charities have followed that. So that's a good example of shared metrics. It happens amazingly rarely in the sector. Charities doing exactly the same thing always have different metrics. I had a vague attempt at one point to try and persuade the big children's charities that they should collect all the data in the same way since they do the same sort of thing and they all thought it was a good idea but nothing happened. Um, more exciting, remote sensing, <coughs> that sounds a good one, and charities are starting to use this and this is obviously that, that you can try and uh, pick up impact without actually having to be there and asking people questions and uh, some examples we used is, a, is the Clean Cookstoves program uh, in developing countries uh, where it's trying to get people to use cookstoves which are less polluting and, um, than others and you can now install smoke sensors to be able to measure what's happening uh, and whether health is increasing and another obvious area that's been used again in, in some aspects of uh, um, the environment is to try and see what's actually happening to forests through satellites etc etc so I'm not saying that's suddenly going to translate into you know what, what sort of bread and butter charities are doing but there are opportunities starting to come here in a way we didn't have it in the past, including actually video diaries as well, just to see how people are responding to mentoring and things like that. Uh, the third one, again, which has been mentioned, which is less about techniques, but making this stuff useful, is the data visualisation. I think you're going to talk about that uh, a bit later on. And there's very interesting stuff there. The Trussell Trust have done some great stuff there, trying to bring supply, if you like, and demand together in maps. And so you can see where the gaps are very quickly. That you'll find your senior management kind of like all that kind of stuff. And the last one I just wanted to talk about, 
was data linkage, which again has been mentioned. Uh, the ability to uh, not only link different data sets, but link them over time. And so I just want to touch on something that we are very keen on at MPC, which is to do with data labs. I don't know if any of you have come across this. This is trying to, this is trying to say what a lot of us do is we have an intervention with a set of people and we think that's going to give them in a better state. But actually, we find it very hard to find out where that happened. Uh, this all started for us in the criminal justice area. So there's lots of charities that work with prisoners. Uh, and they believe that they reduce reoffending. And they couldn't, they find it very, very difficult to find out whether people actually did even reoffend or not. You know, th these, the vulnerable people that charities tend to work with are not the people that you can follow up two years later with a questionnaire. They won't have the same email address or mobile number. So it was absolutely hopeless. Meanwhile, who's got all that data? The government. As it happened, they had it all over the place in sort of local probation and norms and police and all that. Quite frankly, how exactly we achieved this, I don't know, because Chris Galing was the Secretary of State at the time. But the Ministry of Justice have now created a justice data lab. You can go online, you can use it, you can find out the results. And essentially what you do is you say, here's the identifiers of the 100 people we work with. Can you tell us whether they reoffended two years later and set up a control group using propensity score matching? And that's essentially, that's basically what the thing does. It's got more sophisticated over time. Um, so it, it can be frequency of uh, reoffending, and the control groups have got better because they can put things like uh, sort of whether people are dependent on drugs and so on. So it's been very, very powerful using data that's already the government has. So when no one's having to collect any data, charities don't really even have to understand what the hell's going on. They just say these are the people we worked with, uh, and the da Justice Data Lab tells them whether that had an impact. Obviously, there's issues because as um, I suppose people in this room will understand, and often the answer is we can't tell whether there's a difference between uh, doing nothing or not. Not least because people don't work with enough people, enough uh, clients to, to get statistical significance. It's very powerful, and we've been spending a lot of time recently. That was an amazing success, still going, despite cuts at MOJ, they're still running it. <coughs> and we've been pushing very hard recently on health. We've got 24... Uh, Health charities wrote with us to Jeremy Hunt to argue for that, and we're having a lot of discussions with DWP, which look like they may get somewhere to have an employment data lab. That's an example uh, of the way that data linkage, using data that, that is already there. I think it's an outrage that government sits on this data and we're not uh, using it. They're not using it, we're not able to use it. Very, very last thing, uh, because among other things I do, I'm involved in the What Works Centre for Wellbeing, and I, I just wanted to fla flag this up. It's something I feel that you know, at MPC we work with lots and lots of charities and funders. And I think deep down what we're all trying to do is improve, give people a good life basically. Uh, and that's well-being as close as you get to it. We then end up measuring other things because we've discovered we don't get funded if we just say we increase people's well-being. So we say we're going to get needs into jobs or we're going to reduce loneliness of old people. But actually what we really care about isn't just having a decent life and feeling good about, about life. And it's interesting that the well-being, as you can see, um, this GDP has risen over the years, not so much in recent years. Life satisfaction hasn't changed at all, so it's, not, it's something different from just the economy going well. You can now measure uh, well-being. The ONS measures, there's four measures there in a lot of the surveys that Louis outlined early, earlier. There's lots of controversy about whether subjective well-being is the right thing to measure, etc. Et but I, I, I do think it's something that will come into our sector a lot more because I think deep down it's what we're all about. So those are some slightly random thoughts about impact and measurement and um, hopefully provoked a few thoughts. Thanks Dan, that's great. Carl. Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Carl Wilding and I'm from NCBO. Um, amongst, uh, I run a uh, public policy function at NCBO, so policy research and so on, so I'm coming at this from the sort of not just the data perspective but from a research perspective. But I do have a research team staffed by geeks. They're the sort of people who would look at that chart, and then we, sorry, that look at that flip chart, and then we'd have a 10 minute discussion about is it data are people or data is people at the end. Um, John, you must be to sort of disagree with uh, Dan, and actually that's quite difficult because I, I, sort of, I probably agree with, with quite a bit of what uh, Dan said. I think where possibly I do have a point of disagreement, and I'm going to try and touch on this, is that. I mean, if I was going to sort of uh, 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 criticise Dan and NPCs, it, it strikes me that sometimes I think 
there's a view of the world that basically is, well, if you demonstrate your impact, resources will follow, or public support will follow. And I just don't think that's true, uh, uh, is my starting point. Um, just to tell you sort of what we do, you might have seen the publication in CDO produces annually that are uh, working with um, uh, Fair Tech Research Centre called the Civil Society Almanac. And in some respects, that's a good reflection of the sort of data that we have to work with in the sector, in that it says an awful lot about the workforce, which we borrowed from Alistair's work in the past on that. Um, it says a lot about resource inputs that come into the sector, and it also says something about resource outputs, and it says a little bit about impact. So that slide that Dan just had there about contribution to GDP, we can use an ONS-approved method to work out the contribution of our sector to GDP, and it's something like 0.67% of GDP can be attributed to the voluntary sector, which strikes me as a pretty meaningless uh, statistic. It reflects the fact that we've got lots of data about inputs, I think, as Dan was sort of saying, but finding data about outputs is hard enough, never mind finding out data about outcomes, let alone impact. You only need to look at the set of published accounts for your own charity to look at the bit on the statement of financial activities that talks about your outputs and it will say how much you spent on fundraising and then it will probably say how much you spent on uh, support costs uh, and then there will be a very big amount that says how much you spent on charitable activities and that's about it. Yeah. Whilst that's not the state of the art in any way, it's, um, it's sort of where we are. The questions that we get asked about charities at NCVO traditionally have been, or from journalists and so on, traditionally have been along the lines of, well, does this charity uh, make a difference? Um, does that intervention work? Um, increasingly, we're being asked, especially by government, not so much does intervention A work, but is intervention A better than intervention B? Yeah. The, um, uh, I think certainly where lots of commissioners are uh, at, at the moment is that they are absolutely obsessed by uh, uh, low cost, ideally by value for money, and if you're making a pitch to someone who's already delivering a service and doesn't have time to recommission it, or, or is very risk averse and doesn't want to try something different, this issue about <coughs> is your intervention better than what exists already is what we're being asked. So the public want to know whether or not charities are making a difference. <laughs> And by and large, they can't find any evidence that charities are making a difference. Or they can't find evidence that is in a format, and, and I guess here the, uh, uh, the adjective is in a digestible format, that fits their level of understanding of how our sector works. Remember, most people still think charities are staffed entirely by volunteers, and they survive almost entirely on donated income, yeah, which is, is not true. Uh, anymore. And because they can't find evidence of impact, and this is where I think Dan and I will agree, they start asking other sorts of questions instead. So the question that the public and, and the newspapers have been asking an awful lot recently is, how much is your chief executive paid? And how much do you spend on fundraising costs? How much do you spend on admin costs? Okay. Not helped by the fact that charities' accounts don't actually report on admin costs, but that's still very much where the public are at in terms of their narrative, is that they want some sort of measure of efficiency, because that's what they've been trained uh, uh, to look for. Um, they want to know that charity A is better than charity B, because largely speaking, people don't give to charities. People give to causes, or people support causes, and they want to find an organisation that will take forward the cause that they believe in. Because they can't find evidence of, of, uh, of what is making a difference, they're therefore asking proxy questions instead. We've done focus groups with donors, and they more or less tell us this, that because they can't find what they want, they're asking these much more... Um, not, difficult is the wrong question. In some respects, easy. Easy to answer how much your CEO pays. But asking those sorts of questions about uh, inputs arguably take us down the road of... Um, focusing on the wrong things. There's lots of evidence, for example, that charities that, ha that don't invest very much in their back office, in what you might call their administration costs, 
generate less impact than those organisations that have good IT, that have good HR, uh, uh, and so on. Um, there's also the problem, and, and again, this is what this is what people are telling us in focus groups that we do, is that when charities are producing quantitative data about about their processes or about their input uh, or about their impact, people don't believe them. Yeah. Um, has anyone got? Does anyone work with a media officer who uh, used to work for the BBC? No. Yeah. When you next find, uh, when you next work with a media officer who used to work for the BBC, ask them about their experience at the BBC Journalism School, because one of the very first things that uh, that the BBC Journalism School tells its trainee journalists is don't believe any statistics that are given to you by a charity. True. Yeah. And part of the problem here is, as, again, as I think you're alluding to, is we have a problem in terms of how we use data and, and the pressure that we are put under to use data. So Dan used the example just before of the Trussell Trust, where I was sort of slightly sort of shaking my head behind your back. Um, uh, if you've, um, uh, what's, the, what's the charity called that checks facts? Is it literally fact check? Will Downs law. Full, full fact. Full fact, yeah. Uh, uh, the Trussell Trust was taken to task by full fact because their monthly infographics that, uh, uh, that Dan was referring to look absolutely fantastic, but the data underpinning them was not actually telling what full fact believed was a true story about the issue um, of food banks that uh, uh, they were talking about. Um, so on the one hand, people are saying that they want more data about impact, but on the other hand, they're saying that they don't, certainly they don't believe sort of quant data that we produce. So there is a sort of a frustration at times that we sort of can't win. I guess almost sort of just tying up that, that little bit of the conversation is almost to sort of move forward and say, actually, there's a lot about charity that strikes me that's actually quite irrational. And there's certainly a lot of behavior about how donors support charities in terms of their time and their money that's quite irrational. So if we're going to have a conversation about impact, I think we certainly have to move beyond just quantitative data, and we have to think about how to move beyond measurement uh, uh, as well. So we have to start thinking about, okay, well, what is it that people are interested in? What, what do we have evidence of that actually seems to work? So then you start to uh, ask uh, or add to, to the, uh, I don't think it would be an innovation, but you add to Dan's list of innovations, by starting to think about things like narrative, like user uh, accounts. Um, the ESRC, uh, uh, for example, have uh, an absolute uh, battery of performance uh, statistics about the difference that, that social science makes to UK society, but they also have a fantastic little story about how a few years ago, for those of you who are as old as us at the front will remember, uh, about the rolling out of something called 3G, uh, for the mobile phone network, and we're sort of well past 3G now, but it was based upon uh, a small bit of research that ESRC funded at UCL on game theory. And game theory was used to develop the auction for selling off uh, the 3G licenses to the mobile phone companies, which generated 22 billion. 22 billion, yeah, for the treasury. And presumably, ESRC spent a few hundred thousand pounds uh, 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 developing that. So. Moving forward, because I'm probably running out of time, I think we have to be honest and we have to think about who data is for and who impact measurement is for, because not everybody gives because charities make an impact. My wife has just set up a £30 a month direct debit to a charity that I personally think is awful, but there was just something about that charity that has just resonated with her because of the story uh, that we're telling. We have to be clear about why we're measuring, and one would hope that, that, that we are thinking about measurement not uh, because we want to sell our organisation better, and the SROI uh, example that Dan used, you know, he's absolutely top of my list for everything that has gone wrong in terms of data and measurement. It should be about improving services, and then presumably that leads to different sorts of questions. Um, I'd also had a bit about snake oil salesmen, but mine were actually consultancies, like the one Dan runs. <laughs> um, uh, and, and my own, and, and quite seriously, 
we also promote theory of change. My concern at the minute is that theory of change is the new social return on investment. Because it's not a theory, it's a hypothesis. But we're all starting to believe the fact that just because we say A leads to B, therefore it must be true. It's a hypothesis, it's not a theory. Um, and the, the final point is, user voice is essential. Okay, we know this works. Okay, and if you want some really good examples of how to change people's minds about impact and show user voice, in Manchester, uh, um, has anyone come across the Reclaim project in Manchester run, run by Ruth Abegbuna? It is an absolutely fantastic example that for me shows impact by putting young people at the forefront of what they do. Also look at girl guiding and how girl guiding now, they are very much putting forward young girls as the spokespeople for those and using young girls to talk about their own experience and use their narratives because that is what is making a difference. And then finally, I mean, just in an attempt to provoke debate uh, 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 with Dan, uh, an absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because we're not very good at this stuff doesn't mean that we're not making a difference. And you know, I, 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 that's where at times I feel like pushing back, certainly against people in government, who say that, well, because you can't prove it, therefore you're not having an impact. Well, no, that's not true. Right. Okay, thank you very much. That's really helpful. Um, an awful lot to think about there. Um, so I'll throw it open to the floor. We've got, so I know Dan's got a, a train to catch, and we've got around, Carl's got a train to catch. We've got a, a, at least um, half an hour, depending on how long people want to be deprived of their lunch. So if I throw it open, we'll maybe take two or three uh, comments uh, or suggestions. Perhaps what would be really interesting would be to reflect on what you've heard in the light of the experiences of your own uh, organisation, some of the trade offs and, and, and dilemmas and challenges that Carl and Dan are very ably. Uh, raised for us. So, um, who'd like to start, please? Uh, Can you just uh, remind who you are? I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm Fiona Hadley, I'm head of evaluation at the uh, Tools Watch Refund. I was interested by Dan's kind of continuum like, about evidence. And I think the challenge I kind of had with an HLF and in other organisations is senior people tend to be on the left end of the continuum. <laughs> So they always believe everything based on a hunch or they, they think that might be right. And obviously when you use evidence for research, I'm trying to move people along a bit. So I was, I was interested in any ideas or kind of experience you've got of helping them move towards a kind of more evidence-based approach to, to decision-making, basically. Do you want me to? Yeah, anybody else want to follow up on that or <coughs> on similar lines? Okay. No? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 slightly a response to Carl. I mean, you know, we're not stupid uh, in NPC, I have to say. We're very, very clever people. Don't we know. I don't think he said that. But we know, know that people, when they are, particularly if you're in a fundraising mode, which is one mode that in the charity sector we have to be in, it shouldn't be driving everything. We're there for the beneficiaries to do good for them, not, you know, we need the funds, but then it's not the donors who should be our main audience, and sometimes it feels like that. Um, but of course you need stories, of course you need narratives, but we've always said no stories without numbers. So fine to give the anecdotes and the stories and the narratives if your data shows that is more or less representative of what you're doing. If you just plucked the two cases, you know, Fred, we went in, we did violin with him in prison, he'd been a serial offender, we did the violin, now look at him, he's running his own business. If it turns out that that Fred was the only one um, and, and actually, for various reasons, the, 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 you know, it was all dead weight to use a kind of, I'm an economist, so I use kind of, kind of terms, then, then, then that is a very misleading anecdote. And I think one, one should be try to be uh, honest with the evidence. When you've got the evidence, of course, you give an emotional story which, which illustrates the thing that you're doing. Um, the same in qual stuff. People often think qual you know, is bad compared to qual. No, it isn't. Qualitative evidence can be fantastic. It gets you much closer to causation and all sorts of things like that. But you do qualitative well. You know, you make sure that your sample is of different types of people and all the rest of it. You don't just go and, which is what I'm afraid a lot of charities do. And the public sector is much worse at a lot of this. I'm, you know, I've worked there for a long time and public sector evaluation is terrible. And uh, it's very, very rare that uh, whoever you hire to do the evaluation doesn't come back with the answer that you first wanted. It's many years later when the academics get to it that it turns out that, you know, whatever it was, community program didn't really work uh, and things like that. So, so I think that's important. Now how do you get your organisation? Because um, 
I think I think it's difficult. I think um, particularly, and um, we find particularly doing work with the big <coughs> charities, the power of the fundraising team cannot be underestimated. Uh, it's not probably true for HLF, although you don't want to tell people bad stories. You say all well, this money, lottery money, big lottery does the same thing, goes to good causes. If you were then to reveal, but actually. <laughs> Half the money we give out doesn't really achieve much. That wouldn't be very good news for selling more, more lottery tickets. So. But I, I think it's slow. I think it's a cultural thing. I think the new leaders uh, at all levels coming into charities do think a bit harder. They're moving a little bit that way. But I say I would I would be sceptical about about saying you've got to get all the way. I don't I don't think the sort of session with randomised control trials, which personally, you know, uh, we we kind of incorporated from health. Uh, and all those worlds, you know, and we can have the placebo and so forth. I find in social policy, I don't even really believe it. If you find something that's been RCT worked somewhere, uh, that does not tell me, because social issues are so complicated, that it will work in another place at another time. We've had the recent case of the um, Family Nurse Partnership, which had been RCT to death in the US. Brilliant. Came over to Britain. It's just been RCT. It doesn't work. There's lots of debates about why, but one of them is because in the States, if you didn't get the Nurse Family Partnership, you got nothing. Whereas in the UK, you have a pretty decent service, even if you don't get it. Um, so you've got to be very careful on, on these things. So I, I wouldn't push them all the way up that, but certainly getting to a, a bit bit further. Uh, but it's a deep cultural thing. It's not easy. Do you want to come back in there? It's not come back. I just want to add to what, to what Dan said. So Dan and I, I think, are both of a generation that, that we come from an era where people always wrote long reports. Uh, uh, every time we sort of did a piece of research now. And I almost sort of feel, well, given the pressure that a lot of us are under at the minute, it almost feels like I don't want to read reports anymore, I just want to change things. So uh, almost my advice to get senior management listening is, is use evidence and use data to help you change things and then show them the change that you've made. So something that you're all probably going to be familiar with with your teams is that we send out to your organisations, we send emails out to all your organisations and they have open rates of about 20% or something like that. So we've used data to improve the open rates from something like 20% to 30%, doing things like heat maps, A-B testing, that sort of stuff. So change your own service, show that something works and then people will listen to you. The other sort of obvious things to say to you is that it's got to be relevant, it's got to be timely, and it's got to be jargon free. There's no point doing fantastic research if it's out of date, if people don't understand it, um, and it's about something that is not a pressing issue for the organisation. Can we take a moment? Yes, please. Um, my name's Gillian Madison, I'm from Action on Hearing Loss. Um, I'm just wondering I work in the policy team, I also head up the social research that we do, and in terms of using data as an organisation, I can see there's loads of different ways that we use data and evidence, we make evidence-based policy, and we definitely select different types of data based on what we're trying to achieve with it, so we're very good at kind of doing the influencing, getting moving case studies to, to influence donors or um, kind of policy makers in government, and then we're quite good quantitative evidence as well, which we use in different ways. And I like that kind of mix, um, that parcel of the numbers and the, the story, because people respond really well to the emotional stuff. But I'm also quite interested in the digital transformation that we're undergoing as a charity, and I'm working on that, and also what we can learn uh, in the third sector as organisations from the revolution that digital has kind of created in terms of business models and deliveries and what it means for developing better user journeys and how we can use better data collection to incrementally and kind of in a very almost real-time way change the way that we act as charities and not just think about our kind of recipients or targets of data as being kind of people who make decisions but also use data to improve user journeys for our websites, through our services, um, maybe even our staff and so on. And I wondered if there are any charities or any groups that you think that we can learn from who are incorporating that really kind of cutting edge development in terms of feeding in and then changing what we do. Does that make sense? Is that yeah. Yeah. Before we get an answer from Carl and Dan, I wonder if there's anyone in the room who feels their own organisation is perhaps doing that sort of thing or, or other examples that they're, they're aware of. Like to share with us. 
feel free to boast. It's quite it's quite okay. Sure. If not, Carl, would you like to start on that one? Um, it strikes me all the big charities are in that space at the minute. Everyone's thinking about transformation. I think actually on two planes at the moment. One is about digital, and the other is about volunteering. We're all trying to think about how do we move away from just delivering everything via sort of government contracts and, and, and so on, uh, and doing things differently. The ones that I think are cutting edge at the moment, do you know the Inspired, um, which is a sort of a volunteering platform for young people. And if you look at how they're sort of redesigning, um, uh, how they've redesigned their service, all based on, you'll be familiar with the concept of personas, so using personas to identify um, uh, what client groups they're trying to work for. Um, actually, if you were to just Google NCBO on NCBO's volunteering forum, you'll see a presentation from them in Manchester a couple of weeks ago where they were talking about the design principles that they're using for the new website and how data informs what they do, which then takes me to CAST, if you've come across, yeah, yeah. CAST. So um, what CAST are doing in terms of trying to help organisations well, actually, they're about digital, and they talk about being agile uh, in digital development, but from what we've seen in our experience of working with them, those principles of agile development, they're not about digital, they're just about service transformation full stop. Yeah. So, another example of someone who's trying to do that at the moment is Parkinson's uh, UK, yeah. what Julie Dodds is, is uh, trying to do there. But then the final thing I would say is that I think it's dozens of organisations that are, that are at that stage now, it's not hundreds or thousands would be, would be my sense, because this stuff is difficult, it's expensive, and what, what my experience, what we've found is that the skills set required at, at the moment is in very short supply and therefore it's very, very expensive. Yeah. Just to make a bit more, less about digital for kind of service delivery and all that, but about valuation, and two of the things up here, uh, the theory-based evaluation, to some extent, is a little bit more about real-time uh, evaluation. Because I think, I think what, what digital and having kind of real-time feedback allows you to do is rather than say what we do is we set up our intervention, we set up the evaluation, three years later we tell you whether it worked or not, which is a bit hopeless, really, because people in need at this minute. But it's much more, you can, you can start seeing uh, whether things are, are working quite quickly and you can start changing uh, within programme. The, the way the programme's working. I mean, that's a nightmare for evaluation people because, you know, which, which programme are you evaluating? But in terms of helping real people uh, quickly, it's very important. And that, that kind of real-time approach. It's like I think we had at our annual conference last year someone from the Government Digital Service who was talking about the whole way they first designed universal credit. Uh, and it was classic government. And I remember a lot of charities thinking, oh, God, we do the same thing. It's, what do we do? We get a whole lot of people to design the new strategy. We provide a 500-page project plan and then we rolled it out and they were in, they did that for several years and it was a complete disaster I know universal credit is still a bit of a disaster but then they moved to kind of uh, leaner approaches where they just had a smaller group of people they tried it it piloted saw what the feedback was see what wasn't working change the program and all that kind of thing I think is coming into evaluation as well the other thing just to point out is user-centric evaluation getting again you can do it much more with digital you can have pretty uh, real-time feedback from people, how they're feeling about it, how they're experiencing things, and you can feed that into, into what you're doing. So I think these things are quite exciting, and they get us quite close to a, what probably a lot of us always wanted. We don't want to get too sort of distant from, uh, from the people who, who we're actually trying to help, or sort of sitting around waiting for some years. I mean, a classic government evaluation is that the evaluation, a good evaluation, is published some years after the government's changed. And, uh, and the program's already been amended. Uh, you know, it's useful, we learn something about certain kinds of approaches that work and don't work, but in terms of, of those people who could have been helped by that program, it's completely <coughs> hopeless. And I think we feel in the charity sector a bit awkward about spending money on something which will add to knowledge, if we share failure as well, which we've had a discussion about earlier, but actually won't help the people we care about in the meantime. So I think these things are all quite exciting. Um, I just wanted to make a really quick point that might sort of draw some things together about your idea. Um, and one of the things that I like about this real-time feedback is that it potentially, it has the potential to kind of marry two sides, the people who are kind of like working at the front line of the charity, you know, who actually get the kind of face-to-face -face meetings, and the backroom 
people who kind of keep the whole machine going. And we've spoken earlier about sometimes the kind of cultural cultural wounds between those two parts of two sections of charity. But the way this operates it might be it brings the two sides together. That it could be a really interesting kind of mode of conversation between those two sections. I think there are yeah. two questions, perhaps to you first and are they on the same point if we take them both together? Let's see. Let's see. Um, mine was really linked to um, this idea of dig using digital, which feels so sort of big, um, and you know, so it might be that it's um, using data in the background to present something, you know, just in a really tangible way, or we could be talking, you know, service models with, um, coming from sort of mental health background. So far, is is um, is what is what funders are doing in all this. I just want to really yeah. have a more discussion about what they their confidence, what they ask for, what they well, understand, what they I, don't. I mean, it's in, it's interesting. I mean, funders in digital. Um, a colleague of mine, Tris Lumley, wrote a, a rather good thing uh, recently, having us uh, saying that charitable funders were really not equipped to fund digital projects because, uh, first of all, they're often innovative. You don't even know exactly what's going to happen. So you're, funders quite like saying, we'll give you this money for three years and what, what are the outcomes you're going to, the outputs you're going to produce? And the answer is we don't quite know. Um, it's a world they don't understand. Uh, so I think it, it's, it's made it problematic uh, for charities. It's also very hard to fundraise for, for digital things. Um, so I think, I think that's, that's a problem. I mean, the other, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult world. And I think so m and &E type people need to uh, push themselves into this. We, we've had an awful lot of charities recently who sort of, talking to who want, all think they've got to have an app because you've got to have an app these days and they don't really quite know why they want to have an app there's a, just a sort of feeling that it and, and, and you can see where they're coming from I mean everyone seems to be using these things so if you don't you how are you going to link up with your uh, with the people you want to help but um, but then try to evaluate whether the app achieved anything I mean there's other issues about why does everyone why does every medical charity want to invent their own app when all the apps are basically the same with a different front end? Can't we all share it somehow and things like that? But also, how do you evaluate apps? We even had one place that wanted to evaluate the app with a paper-based survey, which at that point seemed things were going a bit strange. Um, so I think we've got to we've got to think about that in the sort of the kind of measurement community. Uh, it's, it's interesting for you saying that you had you know quite good relations with commissioners. Um, I mean, as we know, lots of charities don't have that relationship, and commissioners are starting to think lots of things should be online and all the rest of it. And, they don't quite know what they're, they're doing. So I think it's a difficult phase. And there's a terrible danger we're getting miles behind the private sector um, on all this. Um, 
and um, it's not it's not a great market for them. The innovation <laughs> people talk about AI recently. We had someone from Google Mind talking at our conference last week, you know, and um, obviously they're the sort of leaders in all this stuff. But it's moving very very fast, and the the bright PhDs are not leaping into the charitable sector to help us with the AI. No, just, uh, just the one thing about commissioners, I mean the, the converse of your good commissioning story was in the headlines a couple of days ago, which was Ministry of Justice and, yeah. the, uh, and the Transforming Rehabilitation Companies and their performance indicator was all about referrals, so what have they done? They've, they've focused on referrals and that's a good example of the data that you collect influences the service you provide. <laughs> Quickly, I, though, um, yeah, I think there is, there is real diversity, but I think, I think my sort of thinking about what's needed in the future is and what some of the um, larger BLF, you know, um, ESME, you know, some of those big things are really doing well, um, Cult Foundation are starting to really work together more and wanting to work with local authorities, work with health and, and where we all end up sectoring ourselves it become, I think it can become reductive. Yeah. You know, let's talk about small charities. Yeah. You know, let's talk about working around themes. You know, because our organisation is working. You know, with our parish partners. Our, you know, it's not, it's not helpful anymore. We don't live in that, in that um, commissioning world. So. Okay. Please. I just have a question. Uh, sorry, I'm Lynn Marks and I'm Head of Community Research at Historic Given. Um, I have a question about wellbeing. I mean, so as an organisation, we're actually directly involved in what the Joint Centre for Wellbeing is doing funding and um, having need contact. But, um, so I just thought that, <laughs> to be fair. But my question, <laughs> my position, is how much should wellbeing now form part of evaluation models? And what should we expect from using wellbeing as a measurement like part of evaluation? Uh, I, th I mean, I, I think well, wellbeing is fascinating, and the whole focus <coughs> on wellbeing, with the with all the flaws in, in the ONS measures, which are about life satisfaction and anxiety and so forth, and about subjective wellbeing. Some people don't like that, and they have other measures, but it's raising some really interesting issues and putting them on policy agendas that wasn't there before. I mean, there's a, a, a mental health has shot up the agenda partly because people realise there's nothing worse for well-being than, than mental health. Relationships equally, um, kind of stuff we all knew, but it you put some hard numbers on it and suddenly people take it more seriously. It had a little burst. The reason the What Works Centre, government's got lots of these What Works Centres, and the reason the well-being one got set up was because for, for a period at least David Cameron was very into all this. And, and certainly the inside people in government tell us that the current Prime Minister thinks it's a little bit of Cameronian nonsense. So it, it, whether it's whether government's so interested, but I think it, I, th I think if you look at well-being, probably in the end, what people will do, uh, they'll square the circle. So I was saying that perhaps we should get to a world where the the, the ultimate outcome is well-being. But I think what people will do is they'll say, okay, there's enough evidence that if you improve the well-being of older people, let's say, they're less likely to go into A and E. And therefore, we as a health commissioner are prepared to fund something where the outcome will pay, let's say it's a payment by results contract or something, we pay on wellbeing going up because we know it's well enough established that that reduces any admissions. I don't think that's quite the way it should go round. I think you should be trying to max paying for the wellbeing sort of thing. So you think it's still investment led? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Ultimately, it uh, I, I, it's, it's hard to see that changing. But this is, this is, I mean, this is kind of quite new stuff. Um, Wellbeing is a funny concept. I remember I went to my recent Lambeth Country show, big tent called the Wellbeing Tent. I think that's exciting, and it was all kind of crystals and yoga, <laughs> which is not necessarily what I was looking for. I don't know what I was looking for. <laughs> 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 Nevertheless, Carl, cool. I'm really interested in the sense that we're thinking at, at the minute. My, my chair, who who, who Dan knows well, is is sort of saying to me, "Well, we've got to come up, Carl, with these." Sort of indicators of what the uh, of what is the impact of the voluntary sector. Uh, go away and come back in six weeks, sort of stuff. 
And, uh, and well-being sort of, you know, if we are going to do anything, well-being strikes me as the closest thing we've got to, to a candidate in the sense that it's been a lot of user testing of the subject to well-being, subjective well-being data and so on. And there's another part of me who thinks it's the next F it's the next SROI in the sense that you will just have instead of you know, fifteen pounds for every pound you sell, well, we raise well being from seven point two to eight. There's nothing else can do that. You have to invest in us. You, you could you could point him to some work by academics, not by snake oil academics, <laughs> but by some very large scale and authoritative European studies which actually conclude that some of the aggregate impacts of the voluntary sector are by no means as great as people like to think they are in terms of employability in terms of health and well-being and so forth and I suppose my question there would be to what extent would you actually stop doing things on the back of evidence like that some of which is pretty um, robust by any standards um, well first of all I think we, we at NCBO and, and Dan I think and NPC are the same we, we try and be quite qualified when we talk about things that volunteering for example does in terms of employability or voluntary organizations we always sort of caveat it by saying in, in a particular set of circumstances and so on but let's be honest here, the single hardest thing to do in the voluntary sector is to stop doing things. Without a shadow of a doubt, stopping doing things is the hardest thing ever. Because people start things on the basis that, I have a gut instinct that the healing power of crystals improves people's mental health, and to get someone to disavow that gut instinct is very hard. I mean, I just we we'll say more generally, although we're mainly talking here about the impact of particular charities and whether their interventions work or not, you know, I put a massive value on the existence of civil society in creating social capital, cohesive communities. You know, if you imagine a world without civil society, it would be a terrible world to live in. We can see some countries that uh, have got no civil society and they're not good countries. Now, how the hell we put a value on that? I wrote a pamphlet recently with a professor of politics where we argue very strongly for this, sort of theoretically. Um, but we also get quite a lot of uh, charitable funders coming to us and saying we'd like to fund, you know, as a, as a town uh, and it's, it's really lacking sort of social capital. We'd like to fund something which somehow boosts social capital. Like, well, what is it should we should fund and how would we know if it worked? I think these are really important questions and civil society does, does help create that and, and that, that value goes beyond individual uh, organisations and what they actually achieve. We've got so one last question at the back. Would it be worth thinking about what isn't working? And why can we talk about what works centres, what doesn't? So where data might help, there are um, intractable problems that are proven by data year on year, things like aggravation, lots of issues, things are getting worse in some areas, for example, homelessness. So I think it's worth looking at the spend in those relative areas relative to those data, and then seeing where things aren't working. What is that intervention? And I think where I love that um, the set of graphics, one thing I'd like to see that is user-centred design. So we were talking about the REP earlier, I did impact in the REP, and one of the things we had to prove was the corroboration as well as the evidence. And we had to go and seek that corroboration before we could submit that as an impact. And that was powerful because the assumptions were made that this had worked. And in fact, it had to be proven by the, I suppose, the kind of actee, the kind of the person that was going to tell us whether it had worked. And, and I think it was really interesting in putting that through. So I think what doesn't work, what's not working is a really good way of thinking about this, because we're seeing a lot of polemics between the government model, the voluntary sector model, the university model. I think we're all working to the same goal, which is better somehow. Okay. So I think it's just maybe a different way of thinking. Do, do you want to Oh, yeah. I, I, mean, I suppose my question does relate to, to this, although slightly like tangential now. I mean, it, it was particularly for Carl, although it relates to Dan's sort of credibility pictogram. Um, I was quite interested in the, in the BBC anecdote about not believing statistics, which is useful from a personal perspective next time for someone else me to do something on SPSS. But um, <laughs> I, I guess my question is that, like, I so for, as a, as a member of the general public as well as someone that works in the sector, like I never believe any statistics for anything, pretty much, right? And so I, my question is: Is it something specific? about the charity sector that makes people less likely to believe the statistics that they're putting out? Do they know that we're rubbish, or is there something more kind of existential about it? Um, and if so, how do we go about rectifying that? Is it, as with the last question, being more honest about your limitations as to what the data looks like and how you got there? Or is it simply a question of getting better with the methodology so people are more likely to believe it's more credible? 
or is it kind of what you were intimating, which is a slightly different focus on narrative and quantitative data? Can I just answer the first question? Yes, please. First about, about user-centered design. I'm really glad you used the expression user-centered design. Um, if NCBO puts a survey out to our members and says, what's your biggest problem? What do you most need support from us on? Absolutely 90% every year will come back and say funding, fundraising. No one will ask themselves the question of actually, are there some issues sort of deeper than the fact that we can't attract funding that we need to sort out, such as we can't demonstrate our impact? And so I say that because if we just listened to the data and didn't interrogate it and just did what users told us to do, I don't think we'd actually address the things that they really have got a problem uh, with. On the, um, on the issue about sort of is there something specific about charities, well I think there is something, there's a particular problem in terms of August and the fact that lots of charities publish survey data, opinion polling data in, in, in periods when the media is generally quiet because it tries to get their cause sort of higher up uh, the agenda. I think we're under pressure to, uh, to articulate issues as black or white when we know as researchers actually shades of grey is, is what the reality of, of social research is like. So for me, getting better, it's not, it's not, just a, it's not necessarily a researcher problem or a data problem. It's more of a public policy problem where we have to make sure that our researchers and our, and our policy and our campaigns people are talking to each other all through the process. And it's not just you, you have your research phase and then you have a policy phase and then you have a campaign phase and each one, the, the, sort of the message gets sort of changed a bit. You've got to have people involved at the very beginning and, and, and your predecessor uh, at NPC, Martin Brooks used to Use this phrase once, which I love, which was, we have to be part of epistemic communities where policymakers and researchers understand the field and work with each other all the way through. And there isn't just this tada approach to research findings where you hug, 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 and then just reveal a year later, and, and then suddenly there's pressure to change the meaning. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think what, the trouble is, I mean, the, you know, the great thing about the voluntary sector is we're all passionate about our causes. And therefore, in a sense, the public know that. And so that's why, you know, us constantly churning out stuff that, that there's more need in our sector. Because we have a weird thing. We, want, we need to prove that our sector's got more need than somebody else's sector. And then we also want to argue that everything we do always works. And it's interesting, there's some charities that are better at occasionally saying we did something and it didn't work. And I think that helps, helps their credibility. It tends to be the development charities. I think that's because, or well, my theory is that... Uh, that we forgive them. If, they, if you're working in difficult, difficult countries, running a lot of programs, of course your difficult program in a bit of Africa or something doesn't work, and you report that, and people think, well, I'm glad they did it, and they're, they're a really honest bunch of people because they told us that. Um, so I think there's something... But the, but the weird thing is that the sector is very trusted, um, and, and we've wondered, particularly some of the things we've been talking about earlier, data sharing and consent and all the rest of it, where... The pro you know, public are very suspicious of the private sector. I know we voluntarily give our data to them, the supermarkets and everything, but we're deeply suspicious of what they're up to with our data. We don't trust government because they're going to try and work out we didn't pay enough tax or something. Um, and, they, and the public, everything I've seen suggests the public trust the voluntary sector more with their data. Their problem with us is that they think we're a bit useless and we probably lose the data. Not that we'd use it for bad reasons. So, so we have this kind of trust thing that we're not motivated by private profit or to sort of link up data sets to find that someone should be, you know, deported or something like that. Um, but they don't, but they know that we're so passionate about our cause that to believe everything we say would be a mistake. And to be quite frank, they're probably right. Now, the government uses ONS, so most people believe the ONS data. They don't, don't believe the analysis on the back of it that says, famously, that, you know, if we voted for Brexit, the economy would collapse, although it is slowly collapsing. Um, uh, and uh, you know, should we have a sort of ONS for the uh, for the voluntary sector? Maybe maybe that's what John's role should be doing. Well, that's a challenge. Thanks very much. Well, lunch is uh, waiting for us outside. Can I just thank Dan and Carl for a very engaging. Mm -hmm.